5%. So we see the huge increase of uh, female fans everywhere. Um, and then also, as we have Kevin with us, the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup, their audience doubled in size compared to the 2015 edition. And yet, what do we have to say? That less than 7% of corporate sponsorships worldwide focus on women's sports. And I think this is what we wanna uh, tap into to today or tonight and, uh, and look at it a little bit. And first, I would love to uh, ask Antonia, um, AXA is the title sponsor of the Swiss Women's Super League. And maybe you can get us a little insights, like what were the reasons why you wanted to do that sponsorship engagement? Mm -hmm. So we have a global brand promise. This is uh, No You Can. And this is, as I said, global for every AXA country, this is the same. And in Switzerland, we were looking for a possibility to bring No You Can to life. I think No You Can is not for everyone clear what we mean about it. So for us, it was important to find a way to really make this, the confidence, the self-belief, to really find a way to, to really make this more tangible, that people in Switzerland understand what we mean about No You Can. And so we were looking for the perfect match and we had a lot of discussions and uh, we met a lot of people uh, until we really find the uh, really perfect match for us. And this was the um, not sponsorship, but the partnership with the Swiss Football League. And so we are the, now known as the AXA Women's Super League. Yeah, I think it's, it's very valuable. And actually, Tatiana, what does that partnership, Antonia, you mentioned that you see it more as a partnership than a sponsorship. What does that really mean for you um, as, you know, being with a federation, but also maybe for the players and the league itself? Yeah, for us, it was really um, a milestone. And, and I think we, we, it's underestimated if we, if, if we say we wrote history last year when we started this partnership. Um, women's football in Switzerland or the league, the clubs had uh, no partnership um, yet um, it didn't exist anything and as we also probably will discuss this afternoon or tonight it's so important that women's football has a value and and has has um you know some credibility towards um stakeholders and that also is a big part of it is is a partnership and and of course um money basically and and with oxide was the first one and when we entered this we didn't know all of it of course but we were just super excited we finally had one <laughs> and it was oxa which is also i think important it's 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 a global brand as antonia said it's not you know some small company not known on the market um, who does it for the right reasons as well but on top of this it was a, a global brand and what made it really special, it's not just a partnership in terms of the, of the rights on both sides, like the naming rights of the league, but it, it's way more than this. It's, you know, it's, um, we, we were able together to make sure women's football and club football is now um, online, uh, on TV, on our main channels, um, the national channels, uh, but also um, on TV channels, live matches. Uh, we have a media uh, coverage which we never had before we were able to support the clubs um, a little bit financially and AXA on their side as well are doing a lot to really encourage players clubs um, to to get into that partnership so that they benefit out of it and not just um, I think that it's a whole package on both sides that really everybody um, takes advantage out of it gains something in it and we develop this this product together further for the benefit of, of everybody, basically. And, and that's a really lucky, I think, a case we could we could create here and, and start to work on together. Yeah, really nice. Um, Kevin, you've been in charge of the marketing at the uh, Women's World Cup in France 2019. Um, did you hear like reasons why brands wanted to be involved in the women's scape and uh, also giving the huge success it actually had, you know, in attendance and also in engagement? Was there then actually brands or somebody who was really convinced that women's football is the right fit for them? 
Yeah, well, actually, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, because um, we had uh, a sponsor named Arkema, which uh, they sell chemical, uh, they work in chemicals, actually. And um, they they came with uh, with us, uh, but it, this was their quite their first move in the sponsorship uh, environment. And they wanted to, you know, to make their brand a bit more known in France. Uh, and they wanted to associate their uh, beliefs in women's, uh, I mean, the, 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 the role of women in their company and to express it through the Women's World Cup. So they came, they were quite surprised with the, you know, the impact of the, of the event locally, I mean, in France, but as also internationally, because they are a global company, even though they are not as known as AXA. <laughs> Uh, but what is interesting is that they were so surprised that they uh, maintained their investment by uh, sponsoring the um, Division 1, uh, the first division in France. So they had the naming of the competition, just as AXA did. So it was the real um, uh, you know, situation where a sponsor came, didn't know what to expect, they were so surprised that they continue. And today we work uh, for them and they want to maintain their investment in women's sport, not only in women's football, they want to extend in women's sport. And um, so the answer is yes. And what is good is that an event such as uh, Women's World Cup allowed uh, companies to realize that women's football in this case could be interesting in their communication strategy. And for us, this was a case, you know, in France, because we didn't have that. And I think Women's World Cup allowed that. And well, this was a huge step in, on, in, in France, actually. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, also what a lot of uh, studies actually show that, you know, women's sport is often seen as, you know, more progressive, more inspiring, less money driven, maybe, but also more, you know, family oriented and has, I think, stronger values per se. Uh, and as you said, um, when they said, you know, they, they are aligned with their beliefs um, with it. And I think um, that is maybe something. And what I want to know is what do you all think really the differences are for brands engaging in actually women's sports. So what is really the USP of the women's game? And maybe not even, not only uh, football. I don't know if you are um, in your free time also doing other sports, but you know, what is it maybe that women's sports is different than the men's sport? I can start if I look at my two colleagues here. Um, yeah, it's 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 a difficult question, Marisa, because it, it's so many things. It's the same and not the same, obviously. So it's it's if we stick to football, uh, which is my expertise, then it's football. It's the same game. It's the same rules. It's you know, um, yeah, it's it's the same sport. But if you then look at men's football, women's football, they're totally different. They're huge differences, and I think one mistake we are still doing um, a lot actually is not to separate men's and women's football. Um, women's football is still in this in this football box. Um, is it a club or an organization or an association? And there, obviously, men's football is dominating um, by history, by money, by staff, by know-how, um, by everything. And then women's football should find its place there, which is super difficult. So I think if you separate it and you look at it different, then you see what you actually ask now. It's 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 played by women, which is 50% of the society, and you shouldn't exclude. Um, then it's the athletes are different. Um, let's and but you have everything. You have the grassroots level where it's good for kids to play football, girls and boys. It's fun. It's entertaining. It's life school. Uh, it's it's whatever. You get volunteers into the game. If you don't have little girls playing football, you will never get female coaches, female referees. Um, so it's it's that Meccano and and then it's it's just the athletes by themselves because the men's elite level has its history is different than a men, women's elite level in terms of money as we know in terms of salaries in terms of lifestyle in terms of what these players go through if you're a girl or if you're a boy as of 12 14 until you're a professional athlete it's totally different 
Um, and then, of course, all these things we, I think, know, you know, it's, as you mentioned as well, it's family friendly, you know, the entry ticket is, is cheaper. Um, you don't have to go to five security checks to get into the stadiums. Um, you might even still get a beer with alcohol if you want that. Um, you get your autograph signed after the match. Um, you, you have your kids and your fans close to the players. Um, and the players love to be involved and engaged and, and stand up for their sport and for their future. Um, are probably more vocal in many cases because they don't have to suffer so many um, back uh, slashes if, if they are vocal. Um, so I really think women's football has everything which um, might be interesting for a partner and it's not the standardized typical men's football LED partnership thing. Mm. And for us, this was one of the reasons that it's different because the girls on the floor, they really um, want to, to also work with us. We have a, a TV spot, not with the cost of uh, actors, but with players. And they had fun with us. So it was very uncomplicated. So we really had the possibility to speak with them. They enjoy, we, we all enjoy this. And, and they are so passionate. And I think this is very important because to really fe everybody feels the passion and it's very authentic so it's not like a management and everyone has this PR uh, consultant but it's really authentic and for us this is like we want to be as a brand and so this is really really different as when you have like the superstars in other um, kind of sports. Yeah. yeah just one thing to add yeah you know when we first uh, wanted to sell the sponsorship packages with fifa uh, in france for the competition we we did our you know our homework and we tried to get some um, insight some research on it and what is true is that there is one difference uh, around the values associated to women's football i'm not saying that they this is good or not good but people, they perceive women's football differently than men's football, even though it's the same sport. And it's cleaner, um, it's more open, it's authentic, more authentic, as Antonia said. So there are values that are different. Uh, so, but which means that the audience as well is different or might be different. The question, I mean, the, the thing behind that is that maybe women's sports in general need to grow that audience in order to make the sponsors aware that there are a lot of people interested in that. And this is a work to do, but what is clear is that even if this, it is the same sport, you cannot sell it because we are talking about sponsorship and there is money behind that. You cannot sell it the same way because values are different. Maybe the sponsors, when they come, uh, to, to support a, a women's club event or federation, they are looking for something else that men's sport. So we need to keep that because this is a, a, something strong that they, the, the players, they need to keep, to stay close to the people, to get the autograph, as Tatiana said, that it needs to be maintained because this is a key of success for the future of women's sport, I, I think. Hmm. So we are really yeah, looking at the whole, you know, selling part and, uh, and there, there must be different rules and requirements for the sponsors probably also internally, right? Yeah, but if, if you know, something maybe even, a, let's say a little bit critical to, towards my own federation where I'm employed, but it, it depends also how you package your product. And, I mean, if you look at the organization of men's and women's football, and I'm not saying as, as a was said before it's 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 hard to say if that's good or bad it's just a reality but men are playing in a big stadium they have a media coverage the whole week everybody knows on saturday this match takes place you have interviews the day before you know they're everywhere um women's football sometimes you don't even know when that match takes place and then they play in a little stadium somewhere outside uh, sometimes at four o'clock sometimes at six on a sunday sometimes on another pitch sometimes on the natural pitch then on the artificial turf uh, and and you know this is i think that's that has to be taken up by the rights holders, in our case, Switzerland, the Swiss FA, who package the women's league in a way that it's professional, it's structured, and, and it, it comes across as something with a value. 
-hmm. And now with AXA and our TV deal, since we have um, live matches on TV, the clubs do a lot of efforts to play in the bigger stadiums. We have quite a lot of women's clubs who are linked to men's teams. So, you know, the in Young Boys Burn, as an example, they play, they play in the in the Wankdorf Stadium, which is their main stadium, other clubs as well. So the TV production then also looks different. So the whole product looks different. And everybody who tunes in goes like, oh, wow, that's good. And now maybe a little advantage with Corona, no spectators in the stadiums. You don't even realize that's a men or a women's match until you really look. And you go like, wow, these are women and that's good. And the match looks good. And so the feedback we have from TV, from research as well, is that actually it's really um, has been well, very well received. The figures on TV are good. And I think that makes it then easier to actually go out to the market and look for partnerships. Um, mm -hmm. But so it's, it's, I think that's the first step. You can't look for partner if your product comes across as an amateur um, fifth men's league um, competition. And I think that's a process many countries and clubs have to go through. So then it's probably also that the push factor needs to come from, from the brands. If, if we are not able as federations maybe to quickly adapt and to change that model. And uh, I mean, we all know that also, of course, men's football um, needed some time to get where they are, but compared to, I think the women's game, the women's game, you know, is much quicker because it's maybe more formable or adjustable. Of course, there are more learnings also, you know, from, from the men's game. Um, Antonio, you also wanted to add on that. Yeah, just because, like I said, we are the, the first uh, partner from the, the league existed uh, since 50 years and we are the first, the first one. And we really uh, decided to make the, the next level together. And so this was a, like a win-win-win situ situation also with, with TV, so that we really decided, okay, so together, but for us it was important and also we are everyone is committed to do really the next step and go to the next level and do also the efforts and so mm -hmm. we were we were also a bit pushy to the confederation to really say so okay and now well sleeping is, uh, is finished we really have to go further together and so and and uh, until now it's a very very success story so for <laughs> us it's really the good move yeah well i think you also have to dare maybe and to be maybe bolder also with your ambitions you know I think yes I mean the financial basis you need I mean we all know that yeah there is that um, need there um, but maybe also more that spirit of you know we, we, we try out new things and we you know and we want to make it work even the mindset often helps to change something Kevin how's your experience from the yeah brand? yeah Marisa just wanting to <laughs> To jump on this one because I'm not sure this is the job of the brands. Brand they can support, they can promote, they can, you know, uh, it's cherry on the cake if the brands help the federations, the club. But the problem, I mean, the job is on federations and clubs side. They have to do. The, this is their job to to uh, develop the, the the football or the sports they are. Uh, They, I mean, they are in, uh, but the brands, they can just support the, their job to the brand is to sell insurances or products or whatever, but they can support. And if there is a benefit for the brand, then that's fine. Perfect. Everybody wins in this situation. But the main thing to do is to work on the product, as Tatiana said, to have consistency, at least in the, con in the country. <laughs> but uh, if we can do it uh, on the continent, it will be Perfect, but uh, you know, w w when I look at the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2019, we had the, the you know, we had the, we, we were lucky because it's a huge event. We have FIFA with us. Everything is compacted in a month, so every uh, the media they all speak about that. It's once in a, not a lifetime, but you know, almost. So event is another thing than the daily championship or the cups or because you know in France we we have a, I think a strong championship for the women in football I, I mean but the problem is that we have two teams who are too strong and there is no interest in the championship because we know that at the end there are only two matches in the season Lyon versus Paris and Paris versus Lyon and that's it so this is more difficult for a federation and uh, or professional league uh, depends on the 
who is uh, managing the, the competition, but because all the clubs need to invest to mm. get, you know, to level up the competition itself. So, yeah, not easy, but I think it's more on the clubs and federations to work more than the brands. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, know. but sometimes a boost <laughs> helps. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's for sure. That, that, that's a boost, but it needs to come first from the people in charge, I mean, federations and clubs. Well, I think where we are right now is... is it's a great moment because we, we clearly see only it gets only better. I mean, there's a huge development right now and, and it's fantastic to see. And I don't think that there will be a stop soon. So we're going definitely in the right direction. The thing is, if partners push um, moves and change, which is great. And I actually think right now we're still in a moment where we take more advantage from this than from the federations themselves doing a lot of good stuff so it's the partners like uh, the visas you know and 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 what did we have uh, nike did some great stuff pepsico. and pepsi coded okay. and and what i hear is that they actually ask for more involvement and more rights and more um, possibilities because they want to use women's sports and women's football um so the, the the move and the push right now generally speaking is more from the partners mm -hmm. um but what I wanted to say with this is if the rights holder, the sports organizations, the clubs would do their homework, we would triple or, or, or I don't know how much more increase the speed of the development. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going the right way because we're going slow. So if the clubs okay. would do the right thing, we would actually go way quicker. You know, the, mm -hmm. um, the examples of combined uh, clubs doing men's and women's stuff the same. Um, there are a couple of good examples out there. It's massive what they have reached and, and what they have been able to do. So I think it's it's a change of a mindset of everybody. But the last ones who are a bit slow, in my opinion, are the men's football dominated areas where it takes more time for them to understand the opportunities and, and see the, the possibilities. Well, and probably also see the differences. And in the end, it's the dedication and commitment you put um, your efforts in and, uh, and the belief that there is something possible, uh, even if it's maybe not the, you know, you cannot use the same blueprint um, for the women's game and, and creating women's leagues, etc. Because, yeah, it, it's just not possible. But I think there are also huge advantages, right? Because, yes, you have, I mean, the historically, um, the sports industry, you know, use, use linear TV, and the going to a, a match, that's, that's what made the fandom. You know, it's watching either on TV or going to the, to the game. But I think nowadays, um, I mean, sport grew so much also and, and digital environment grew so much. So it's much more today. And when we're thinking that, you know, women are 41% um, stronger or have a stronger preference for social media, for example. So there are actually, I think, huge opportunities um, to, to create a different product um, when you have that commitment to try it and to look for new solutions and not just you know do, do it the easy way, copy and paste, because that's always easy yeah, to, to just take a product and then uh, put it onto uh, another one. But I think we all know, or at least all the brands know that this is usually not working very well. Um, and there it comes probably what you also say, Tatiana, you know, the, the federations need to make an effort in thinking differently. Yeah, just to throw it out there, one of my most favorite examples is the FIFA Women's World Cup with, where the rights are still not unbundled. And I get it, you know, there's long-term contracts and, and maybe it takes another 10 years. I'm not aware of the details, but there must be reasons for not doing that. But this is the world's biggest women's team sport event in the world, and it has no value. They cannot say what is, if you want to, as a sports agency, you say, I want to take it on. I want the Women's World Cup. You don't know. There's no value because it's, it's unbundled and uh, not unbundled. And I think that's a massive, if you would be able, to, all these success stories from the FIFA Women's World Cup, if you would be able to say we have whatever they have, six um, main partners and another four or six, uh, it's not called national supporters anymore, but whatever, and the TV rights and everything would be dedicated only on this FIFA Women's World Cup. Mm. You probably would make millions, millions, millions. I'm not putting any figure out there, but it would be a lot. And then you can finally start going against that odd of women's football is not um, profitable and it doesn't create any money. And then I think that would start changing 
the culture and the mindsets. Mm. But if the b- biggest sport is not has no value, it, it, it's really difficult. <laughs> well, it's also I think the role model thing again. You know, I mean, UEFA now did it um, with you know taking the uh, women's game out of it and selling it, and you have those forward-thinking brands you just mentioned. You know, like Visa or PepsiCo, or in the uh, women's FA Cup where you have uh, Vitality uh, jumping in or the um, NWSL. You know, with uh, Google and Nike going in, I think, and uh, Antonio also mentioned it, you know, brands think, you know, where's my value from it? And we've seen that that whole corporate um, or more social responsible thinking, you know, how do I really engage my customers, my consumers truly and authentically with a product leads you often, and when you, you said it in the beginning, towards okay what is the best fit for us for our slogan mm-hmm. for our commitment and it was the women's football yeah In, this is my, my personal view but i really strongly believe that the brand uh, we are talking a lot about purpose oriented we are talking about brand promises and i really think it should be really authentic that you decide as a brand which kind of partnerships or uh, sponsorships it's it's important really to to interact with because if our uh, consumer has to take a decision when they choose uh, the insurance or another product, they really want a brand who suits to them. And and it's difficult to make an insurance or insurance product like, we are not an iPhone. <laughs> so, and then it's important that really do, people have a good connection that to say, okay, it's purpose oriented. It's uh, the brand, it's very near and this is, should be a good match. And mm-hmm. then it's really important that it's, uh, that it's uh, like the, the, the people really believe also that you are authentic and, do, and you really believe what you do. Mm-hmm. But I think you also show how probably, how hard it is um, for for both sides. I mean, um, you mentioned that, you know, you had that internal talks, you know, what do we want to, like, where's the right fit for us? Then you have marketing agencies who have rights holder on their side, they're giving them a guarantee, um, and then they're looking for sponsors. Um, But as you said, like, you you as a brand needed to go through that mindset and, 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 commitment and, and looking for okay, what is our right fit already internally and you know the company very well whereas um, an agency or a sponsorship sales guy out there don't have that in, or doesn't have that information necessarily and they are just worked you know they just looked at the tv numbers tv ratings etc and that's how they usually sold their sponsorships you know it's very much more data driven on a on a different level now you comes in that emotional, the authentic part, the purpose, the purposefulness, etc., which is probably still now harder to evaluate. And yet that was the main reason for you to go into that. So maybe that is then also where we need to look at, do we sell or, or do we um, have the right people there to actually do that work? Right. I don't know. I don't know how you how did you then approach um, um, uh, the Swiss Football League and Tatiana? So we we spoke to really a lot of, of people. We had uh, from the music, from the culture part, from also uh, universities and also sports. And so really we we, we put our uh, our network to really speak together. And then we had the contact also with, uh, with the football league. Mm-hmm. And so and there was just uh, in the beginning, just a call and then we met, then we met again and again and again. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we, yeah, this is a hard decision that this is hard work. And I don't think so that the sponsorship now it's like, okay, um, the CEO plays golf. So we make a sponsorship in golf. Uh, it, it should be, as I said before, really a strategic decision and the strategic decision needs time. And mm-hmm. really, this is not a, like a feeling. And okay, so I used to play floorball for 16 years, but it's not the reason that we have a, like an in floorball. So really, it's important to, mm-hmm. to yes, a sponsorship is very strategic and on a, on a very high level. And for me, this, that means work, mm-hmm. hard work. <laughs> I mean, Kevin, you also 
yeah, um, saw probably both sides, you know, selling to yeah. men's sport and women's sport. What do you think are the, the most critical differences? Well, just to share my opinion on that one, on the last topic, I think the, the federations, club, they need, well, there are three main points as far as I'm concerned, is that first they need, the federation club, they need to create their own audience and to make it the bigger, uh, as big as possible. Um, and then they need to create programs, the programs that can be sponsored or supported by the brands. And then to make their job, the job to understand what is the, what the brands need. And AXA needs something, but Coca-Cola, Coca they don't need exact, the exact same thing. And according to what they need, you say the right program to reach the audience. All of it or part of it depends, but that's a job that men's or women's rights holder need to do because that's uh, you know sponsorship. It came to a point where it's very well developed, and uh, the, the the brands, from what I know, they they all have like uh, the bosses. They want a return on investment. It could be money, business. It could be communication, or it could be CSR objectives, whatever. But at the end, you need to report something. Is it working or not? So from a federation or club perspective, you need to understand that and to uh, come on the, into the market and offer the programs that reach a uh, company's objective. So it seems to be obvious when you say that, but it's not as obvious as you can imagine in the sports environment because Maybe sometimes the, the, the federations or clubs, they don't have the resources internally, you know, the people that are able to do that. So that's a reality. We are talking about football and football has the money to get people. But when you go out of football, then it becomes difficult and they are not all of them are not um, developed in terms of uh, human resources. And sometimes they give, give their rights to an agency which has their own objectives often driven by um, <laughs> money and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, earnings uh, at the end of, uh, <laughs> of the year. But so it's complicated because, so my point at the end is to, that Federation Club, they need to structure itself, themselves, sorry, in order to reach brands and to sell their own packages. And at some point it's men's and women's sports there is no difference, but maybe, yeah, women's sports more because let's say that it's uh, new in, at some point, but um, the, the, the mechanic is the same, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, it will be, I mean, it's tricky. I also see it, you know, I mean, federations have, should have a higher purpose. You know, they are, I mean, they're all state funded, usually and uh, in the end there and, and the priority is to develop uh, i mean to to perform uh, from a sports perspective and then to develop the sports uh, from a grassroots perspective uh, then you need to understand that you need to get money to develop and to perform but i mean it's quite natural to be focused on the sports and grassroots first before marketing but i think that all is related and the more you market your product the more you sell it the more you get mm -hmm. money to develop and it's uh, you know a circle like this but it's not it's very easy when you say that but then when you you need to implement it and but you don't have the the money to to do it to finance the the people or it's, yeah it's complicated so i mean i think that's where i also meant maybe the, the push needs to come from the brands because I think brands see, I mean, they have, and I mean, Antonio, you know that you need to sell in the end to a consumer, your insurance or product or whatever it is. So you have that immediate feedback from the consumer. In sports, we don't have that. I mean, we're funded by the state, by governments, etc. So money comes in anyways you know, at least at the federation level. So the, the pressure is never really high enough to say, hey, we need to change maybe because it's a comfortable situation. You have might be a little less or more or whatever, but, um, but the brand, they have that pressure 
especially I think with uh, Gen Z coming up and uh, Gen Alpha and etc. So they are much more purpose driven and it's just a dif different generation. So they're looking for that uh, idealism, the, the image of a company and, and nowadays everybody is visible. I mean, you can type an exa in Google and we'll get every good and bad things you find about that company. And it's for every company the same. So it's much easier to get information and, and much harder for a brand probably to, you know, to do something which is not aligned with what they are and what they stand for. Um, so I think that gives or is maybe the opportunity for sports, maybe from the outside pressured a little bit, but to change because now brands are coming in and you hear it more and more often also with the topic of equality even within the company and I know Antonia that AXA also does a lot internally in that regards and I think that adds then also on because you have the consumer but you also have your own employees in a company that want to see that you speak truth to yourself and that you actually walk the talk um, and this maybe then creates a pressure towards clubs and federations because now probably more and more companies will also come and say, hey, you say you do that, so show me what are you actually doing? I don't know what your experience is there. If at all, if you have any. Yeah, from my point of view, I think it's in, in brand or in marketing or in, in, in the companies, it's always important to be really um, authentic and really what you do and also the identification from the employees with the own brand is also very important and of course we have 8,000 people in working in, in only in Switzerland for EXA and this is also like the feedback we became um, we had from the, the sponsorship very often and you know the the stereotype of the insurance guy is the man with the suit. So uh, it is also a new, a new culture at, at AXA and, and new, and, and as you said, so diversity and equality for us, it's from a long time ago, a, a, a very normal. And we, we talk about it at the for uh, people can work part-time and all this kind of stuff. It, it's moment a lot in the, in the media for AXA. This is really in the um, cultural DNA, but of course in the, when we decide for, for cooperation or collaboration, not just in, in sponsorship, but also in other business parts and the system, we have a lot of collaboration with cooperation. And then it's very important that also this, the, the match should be very good as well, so that you really have to find, you have to be, you have to be in the, on the same page on the very value part. And so, um, yeah, and it's important that uh, both um, partners are very open-minded and in the case of uh, the, the collaboration we have with, uh, with the Confederation Swiss Football, we have the right person there also. So with Tatiana, we have a strong leader um, and she stands for the, 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 the topics um, in Bern. And so we have two strong ladies fighting for the same. So this is a, a good match as well. <laughs> But we also know we need also the strong women, uh, the strong men out there because, uh, yeah, you're you're till now much uh, much more in the business, uh, and I think, I mean, it's it's probably yeah difficult for um, for men also to you know get maybe that that mind shift and maybe that vision and maybe we need also more vision to create yeah. something new. I mean, that, that's a hot topic and a sensitive one, the whole gender discussion. And, and I, I would fully agree with you. It should not be about women, uh, only women or so. Um, and it's a mix. And we, we always need both sides uh, to be really successful. But where I agree with Antonia, it's, it's, it's different. And because we have a different passion and different mindset. So what's lacking in our football culture in Switzerland is... Um, men having the right um, understanding or feeling for women's football. Uh, it's not that they don't want, but they're not used to it. Um, for them, in their mindset, it's still a, a very low-level amateur um, sport, which is, is never going to be profitable. It, it's just what they think. And mm. there are men out there who are totally different and who, who would be a great asset to, to our partnership, but they're not 
there yet. Um, we all know in, in some organizations, um, the average age uh, of, of the members in certain committees, uh, we all know how, how many years they have already um, been sitting there. Um, so this is really, this is hard to, to change and to modernize and to, and, and women's sports and women's football is something new. And I think it's not about men or women, it's just the fact that the men, also the women sitting there, sometimes if they're long enough there, you become blind, you, 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 you just become whatever is asked from you. And that's what needs to change. And not mm. if it's men or women, but obviously right now it's way more women who, who go for this as, as we have with Ox and us. It's, um, it's actually, I don't know, I would say 80% to 20 or 70 to 30 women. And, and it's, it's great because we all share the same passion. But that the guys we have in our project teams are great too, but they're they're young, <laughs> and maybe that's that's the that's the answer to this. And uh, as uh, Kevin said, uh, or also you, uh, Marisa, I'm I'm very KPI driven, so it doesn't it's not it doesn't matter if I'm, I'm a man or I'm a woman. So the KPIs counts, and I, to the management board, I also have to report the KPI. But um, we need a bit of. Um, time to really get also that uh, the support that okay now you have to believe in so I'm, I'm sure and then you need also the passion mm -hmm. to really have also the confidence to say okay I want to fight for this but of course at the end of the day um, we count KPIs so as mm -hmm. Kevin said this is we are in business <laughs> yeah and I, I'm going to defend you know men's position so we are not like <laughs> uh, bad guys <laughs> No, no, but more seriously, I mean, we can find women who, do, who don't believe in women's sport as well. So I'm, I'm not sure it's a question of men or women, but what is true is that women's sport, or, and let, let me talk about women's football, because when we worked on uh, the FIFA Women's World Cup, we needed to prove when we, I mean, three years uh, before the competition, we created the LOC, and I was the first one to wonder if there was an economy behind women's football. We knew the, the value that it existed, but is there enough brands, TV, enough people interested in that to, I mean, to finance the event? Because that's what we needed. So we needed to prove it. And I mean, my friends, in 2016, when I uh, told them that uh, I, I was uh, working on that, no one was interested in buying a ticket, 10 euros. That's a reality. But at the end, three years later, we proved them wrong. We showed them that uh, it's, it was not 10 euros. It was more like 25, 30 euros. And some uh, matches were uh, sold out so they were, were not they were not uh, able to buy tickets so i mean women's sports need just to prove it in, uh, but what is true is that we are all driven by figures by economy so we need to show that there is something behind and money can follow um, through brands, through people as well, because they can buy tickets, merchandise, F and B at the stadium, and you know it's, it it allows the the clubs and federation to live as well and to show that people can spend money. There is a consumption of women sports, and I think that's something we need to show that there mm -hmm. is money behind that. And uh, the with the women's World Cup, we were allowed to. We were able to show that um, by facts, because to be honest, we were a bit surprised by the figures as well, you know, in terms of TV audience. Mm. Internationally, we didn't expect, I mean, it, uh, I will not speak uh, on behalf of FIFA, but on behalf of myself, but I was not uh, expecting so many people watching the games uh, internationally and in countries where you know, the, the, I don't know the word in English, to be honest, but macho, you know, the people who, yeah, who, yeah macho, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the, in Italy, because, you know, Italy, they performed well in the competition, but people were following it in Italy. Mm. Whereas we know that Italy might be a, a country where men are more, you know, macho, let's say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we need to show. Mm. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's yeah, really interesting. Um, we have uh, some questions. 
Do you have a vision on key values that need to match before stepping into a sponsor or partnership in this uh, emerging markets? Is there, are there some triggers you think need to be there before actually doing a sponsorship? Yeah, I think so. the The DNA of the of the company, you, you have to know what's your your DNA. So, what's your mission? What's your vision? Uh, what's your purpose? What's your brand promise? So, you have to know this kind of marketing stuff, <laughs> and 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 the culture of the company. And then you have to try to find uh, a partner who has there the same values. Hmm. Not one hundred percent, but the but the, the central part of really the values should be similar. Mm. And I think there, I think in a, on a brand perspective, it's usually easier to find those values and those, you know, guiding principles and all those kind of things, because you think that's the essential part of a brand. I think that's maybe sometimes tricky for a federation, you know, where are our values? Where do we stand? And, uh, and then, you know, Tatiana, to your point also to, you know, divide men's and women's sport because they have different values. And maybe that's also a homework for federations and clubs to really think about those values. What do we represent? Where do we want to go to be also found maybe by sponsors, by partners? Because, I mean, Antonio, you also said you looked at different um, choices, you know, so that needs to match. And if you can't find it, it's then the same problem a salesperson at, a, at an agency have if they mm -hmm. don't know what you, what your purpose and your values are, it's vice versa, yeah, so. Yeah. But it's, it's not like a kind of checklist. You can go with, with your things. It's okay, we are looking for a partner. It's not like Tinder, you know, you can just, uh, so you have to talk to the people and yeah. uh, the business is about talking. And as I said before, this is not a chat of 30 minutes and then you said, okay, go for it but you really have to, to know each other and really try to understand the, the values and the aims hmm. on, on, on the, the counterpart. So this needs time. Yeah. And, then, and this is not like just a chat, yeah. Yeah, and there maybe comes what you said, Tatiana, that uh, you know, the, the environment maybe needs to also adapt a little bit. Who is you know, making decisions? Are they, what are they looking for? I mean, yes when you begin with something it's different as when you have been there for 20 years successfully um so and yes and maybe the kpis on a federation and men's sport is are different because they have to be different because it's longer there so but where do you start for the women's game yeah i mean obviously as you have figured out by now probably i'm, I'm not the super marketing expert I'm, i'm the women's football expert but i have to be self-critical and i i think i've said it before if the rights holder in our case the swiss fa is is not able to make women's football is it the national teams or the club an interesting product how can we assume to find a partner who finds us interesting I mean, that was a super lucky punch with AXA because I'm 100% convinced women's football and women's sports is interesting for brands and is going to explode and will only grow. But I really think the owners, the, the associations and the clubs are not yet doing enough for what they could to make it even more interesting. And, and that's something um, we learned. I think it proved us right in, in this case with, with AXA. We started from zero we we were lucky to find two wonderful i think um, groups of people and interests and now we can see even in that half year or a bit more the figures we have on on the tv side on the media coverage um the public perception um what i know from antonia how happy they are on, on your side and, and how it goes it's just just a pure success story so far and we're at the beginning of it so we're starting to to play in bigger stadiums we're starting to have um, even the clubs start to have more followers, more fan engagement, more interest in their club because it's they play in the AXA Women's Super League. So, um, yeah, I really think we should, or we, a, a club and, a, and an association or a confederation should package women's football, in, in my case, properly, make it attractive, have a clear plan where do they want to go with women's football? You know, wh where do we want to go with the Women's World Cup? Do we mm -hmm. know that? 
I know it has been expanded to 32T, but the rest, do we know more? How do you, you know, work with the partners? How do you work with the TV rights? How do you, and that's the same for us as a league. How do we work with our clubs? Um, there's so many questions and I really have the ambitions that we as an FA, we get better to make OXA even more happy and to hopefully find one partner more or two partner more so that this women's football product has a, a proper value. Mm -hmm. And I mean that, oh, go Kevin. No, no, I just wanted to add that maybe with the next Men's World Cup coming in a, a bit more than a year, and in a, let's say, I think there will be a lot of debates around this competition. And maybe we, the brands and the people will have another view of women's football. So it's not good that uh, we are in this situation with the men's football. I'm not saying that, but at some point we will see that values behind women's football are clearly different and can benefit to the brands, can have a strong benefit for the brands. So, so I don't want to speak about the men's competition in 2022, but it might be an opportunity for women as well to show that there is a difference, mm -hmm. the same sport, but there is a difference. There are other values and they, that, that can benefit as well the, the, the federations, the sports itself, but also the brands. And I think at the middle, there will be the people that will be more interested because it's cleaner, more authentic, more, you know, you can have an interaction with some player at some point. But so, so yeah, let's hope that, well, I mean, we need to, to grab this opportunity. Mm. I mean, also because uh, you mentioned also, you know, again, that family oriented, um, I think, you know, there is also proof out there that it's a safer, a safer environment. Yeah. Um, and I think this has been also a, a big discussion, you know, how did the, uh, on the, on the club level, on the, uh, in the stadiums, did the stadium experience uh, maybe change to, towards the, the needs of, fans nowadays I, I remember like a huge discussion in Italy you know why people would not go more to stadium uh, to live matches because they were scared of going to the stadiums because they you know were not maintained very well the I mean we all have been to football matches the offers there are very let's say male oriented you know bratwurst and uh, and uh, and beer But women and families look for other things. And yeah, I'm a big ice hockey fan, for example, you know. Um, so when I go with my daughter, and I love to go with her together because we can do something together, um, I don't want to give her every time bratwurst and french fries, you know. And so my expectation would be a total different one than maybe a fan, a male fan who just say, you know, I need my beer and my bratwurst. So I think this perspective also goes you know then much deeper you know what can we offer how can we make it different not just the the game not just you know the sponsorship around it but the whole experience around a sport yeah and uh, and I mean yes I think for me you know I'm coming from athletics uh, I mean athletics our um, positive asset is that it is inclusive because we have uh, almost the same level of men and women uh, in the game um, on the field But um, it, yeah, it creates, um, it's, it, it's still, I still think that we can also as an individual sport learn a lot from football and football should take the lead of being a role model because it has the resources. That's what I always think, you know, I'm, even if I maybe uh, was never like the biggest football fan because I was never really engaged with it, but I think you should learn from the best and use the positive things of it. And then as being the best, you also have an obligation to be true to yourself and remain a role model. And that's what I always think, you know, where football could be such a good role model for all other sports if they would take it seriously. I don't know if you would agree with that. <laughs> I would, uh, I would, and, and and in many countries, football is the most popular sport, um, and and we know that the number of girls playing football is is way under 
um, the percentages of the boys and, and now we wonder why is that is it because girls don't want to play football or is it because football doesn't really welcome the girls and this you have to find out and, and, and but it's a huge potential and um, I would agree football can play so many important roles um, if the focus is right and some there are some really good things as well um, I think so that that's true but it could be definitely be better. Mm. But one challenge as well is that if we develop um, professional women's sports, uh, let's say football, um, we have what is clear is that the audience is different. It's more family oriented. It's clear. But if we develop it and then there is more money, then there is, we tend to go uh, on the men's side you know, with the supporters and the problem because or the money will generate other problems. So the question is, how do we keep these values um, while we are developing ourselves because the values are at the heart of the, uh, let's say, the why the women's sport is good or why women's football is good to the brand, for the brand. So they need to keep that. This is the hurt. And so we need to be careful with development because sometimes it could lead to some, you know, bad um, habits, let's say. Mm. Yeah, true. Yeah, just thanks, Kevin, for raising it. I tried not to say everything I usually say, but women's football dedicated structures is my mantra since 20 years, and I don't see it. Uh, some have a proper organization, but not the uh, respective know-how or they don't have the proper organization but an example where you have a really good women's football organization in a in a in a football organization i really don't know many uh, where i could say this is a, a great example on how you can protect those values um, produce a better product you know make it successful and sustainable and create great partnerships there's not many i think england is doing it quite well right now um <laughs> of course <laughs> Of course. Uh, no, I mean, there's good good things out there. Definitely a lot of good things. But if you look at the whole football landscape, it's minimal. And and I think that needs to be changed. But Kevin, I, I agree totally. It, it has to be women's football focused by men and women, but with women's football know-how. Hmm. And maybe that's a big uh, or good shout out, maybe also to the industry out there and not only, you know, agencies or so, but maybe educational systems, you know, I mean, that's a great case study maybe for some universities, you know, to tap into and think about, you know, what would be the right structures for the women's sport games, you know, not only football, but women's games in general, you know, how could it, could it be developed? And, uh, and yeah, I mean, we're in the 21st century, uh, the uh, federation system is a uh, over 100 years old, uh, society changed a lot since then. Maybe that's a, a starting point for some new discussions we can have to see, hey, is it the right model we are having? Or do we maybe need to change something? I mean, it's a broad and huge question and not everybody will probably like me for that. Um, but I think, uh, you know, discussion is always good. And um, it's already uh, seven. <laughs> So we said we, we want to keep it to an hour. Um, I think it was a, a fruitful discussion and I hope also that um, a lot of people get um, something out of there or at least, you know, triggered some more questions and uh, maybe some reflection also. Um, for myself, I would say uh, women's sports is definitely the future of sponsorship. And uh, that's what I would like to know from you with a, with a yes or no. And I know what I will get, but... <laughs> I think from all of you, it will be a yes. That's uh, that's good. Um, just one quick question. Did you in life um, had a mentor? Did you work with a mentor? I had you? one. You had one? Kevin, you? Uh, I have uh, sources of inspiration. I mean, two or three people that I follow on a daily basis, but uh, no, not a mentor like this. Okay, Tatiana? Not reader. My motivation was, okay, that's not how I want to do it. Okay, but um, actually we will um, having a mentorship program at SheSport Switzerland. So everybody who's uh, keen on maybe, you know, getting some inspiration 
um, some advices uh, or just, you know, a, a partner in crime for, let's say, um, for the mentorship program, please, you know, visit our website at shesportswitzerland.com and would be very happy. And I'm very happy that I had you tonight. I think it was really nice. I hope it was not the last time we can talk about that because I think uh, there is much more we need to do and, uh, and need to continue also that conversations. And yeah, I'm very thankful that you were here. Um, there is a, a short survey um, for the ones who attended. Um, it's in the chat who can do it, that we can also improve that format and uh, yeah, and then hopefully um, we will see more sponsors coming into the women's game and, and all federations committing to women's sport as well. Thank you very much to Tatiana, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.